Wow, we've got a new record. My name is Felix and I'm your host for today's episode of What About It? Elon Musk reveals the third generation of Raptor engine, SpaceX will launch a private space station, United Launch Alliance tests Vulcan Centaur and the European Space Agency fixes juice. Stay tuned and let's dive right in. Starship Updates Another week, another Starship update. In our last episode, we delved into the secrets of pile construction, and today that knowledge will prove invaluable as SpaceX's tireless workforce tackles the restoration of the orbital launch mount's base. But wait, there is more. Brace yourselves as Elon Musk tantalizes us with a sneak peek of mind-blowing third-generation Raptor graphs, but more on that later. A lot of things happening at Starbase right now could be summarized in a single sentence. One big piling operation. Over the last few days, workers assembled massive rebar cages on site, which were later lowered into the previously dug holes to strengthen the foundation of the orbital launch mount so that rock tornadoes belong to the past. If you think that the reinforcements look rather long, then you are correct. If we take the OLM as our point of reference, we can estimate that the cages are over 30 meters long. SpaceX doesn't really fool around when it comes to beefing up the launch mount. After the rebar cages were placed inside casings, concrete was poured to complete the pile construction. Of course, with holes this deep, you can't just dump it straight out of a concrete truck, as this would cause numerous problems. That's why a tremi pipe is used. A tremi pipe is a tool typically made up of multiple removable segments with a hopper on the top. By removing or adding those segments, the desired depth can be reached. Once the pipe is at the hole's bottom, concrete can be easily poured into the hopper and transferred to the bottom. Using a tremi pipe prevents concrete contamination and segregation, which could lead to an overall weaker structure. Again, we don't want that for the next launch. Thanks to the latest flyover pictures from RGV Aerial Photography, we can clearly see some of the finished piles. The true extent of the pile construction underneath the orbital launch mount can be challenging to find out without direct access to the site. But by analyzing the photos, we can conclude that the plan might be to have 6 piles inside the hexagonal base and 12 piles outside, 2 for each wall of the hexagons. Interestingly, sections of cryopiping that were previously hidden under the so-called doghouse were removed on May 12th. SpaceX either decided that they've suffered too much damage during the orbital launch attempt to be saved, or maybe they are colliding with the new Raptor-proof deluge system. Either way, they'll likely get replaced. Prepare to be amazed by the remarkable water-cooled steel plate and the exciting developments captured in the aerial photos of the launch site. Let's begin with an intriguing fact. 18 black high-pressure tanks have been strategically relocated near the water supply installation. These tanks are anticipated to be mounted alongside the existing white high-pressure tanks, forming a formidable network. While 18 tanks may sound impressive, brace yourselves for even more to come. As the project progresses, we anticipate an increase in the number of tanks, ensuring an ample supply of pressure. Why is this significant, you might wonder? Well, achieving sufficient pressure to overcome the intense plume of the Raptors is a crucial element for the entire system to operate effectively. The water pressure needs to be strong enough to overcome 33 Raptor engines. It's an essential puzzle piece in creating a robust and reliable setup. If there isn't enough water pressure, some gases could get trapped inside the steel plate, which would have disastrous consequences for the entire system. Additionally, we should start to see some serious work related to the water manifold soon, as another section of the massive pipe was placed near the white tanks. Many casings, parts of rebar cages, as well as tremi pipe pieces are scattered around the launch site. This can be a sign that some other construction is about to start. An excavator with a white hammer attachment could be seen removing concrete near the orbital tank farm. Right next to it is another drilling rig with an auger attached to it, as seen in pictures captured by YCAM operator Chief. 
This is a different type of drilling rig than the one used right now at the orbital launch mount. The continuous flight auger allows pouring concrete at the same time as the auger is being pulled out from the hole. I've explained this method of pile construction in detail in the previous episode. My suspicion is that work has begun on the orbital tank farm expansion, announced just after the Starship launch by Elon Musk himself. We have to wait and see if the excavator will move to the other tank's side. If so, then that would be pretty concrete proof, pun intended, that more hot dog looking tanks will be installed near the already existing methane tanks. It's staggering to see how much hard work is being put in by the workers to hopefully launch another starship this year. But I have to say, it definitely doesn't look like everything will be ready in a month. Elon time. Now let's look at SpaceX's newest invention. You might already know that right now we're in the second generation of Raptor engines. And back in February 2022 when it was announced, Raptor 2 felt like a game changer. A more powerful Methalox engine with two design principles at its core. Reliability and simplification. Repeat after me, the best part is no part. Compared to its predecessor, Raptor V1, Raptor 2 proved to be a lighter and less complicated marvel. It achieved improved reliability, reducing the need for engine replacements after static fires a significant leap forward. However, like any innovation, Raptor 2 had room for improvement. That's why SpaceX has been hard at work developing the third generation of this extraordinary engine. While we haven't spotted it at Starbase yet, Elon Musk has shared tantalizing details on Twitter. In a recent static fire at the McGregor test facility, the measurements revealed an astonishing 269 tons of thrust on a single engine. 39 tons more than Raptor V2 and a mind-blowing 85 tons more than Raptor V1. Can you imagine that? With 33 of them, Super Heavy could generate 8,877 tons or 19.5 million pounds of thrust. Giving us a thrust to weight ratio of 1.78. With such a TWR, Starship would clear the tower instantly. Naturally, too high of a thrust to weight ratio can also be a bad thing. So the more likely approach would be to lower the thrust at first and then throttle up mid-flight. We need to keep in mind that even Musk himself was surprised that the engine performed so well. What's even more fascinating is that Raptor V3 broke yet another world record, reaching an incredible 350 bars of chamber pressure. It's astounding to witness how SpaceX continually pushes the boundaries of what's possible. Though the newest Starship engine might not be ready for routine operations in such extreme conditions just yet, it's only a matter of time until it becomes a reality at Starbase. The potential of Raptor's development over the next decade is mind-boggling. It makes you think where the limits of this engine are. Previously, 300 bar was the magic number that would allow SpaceX to start mass production. Back then, many doubted that going over 300 bars would even be possible, but now here we are at 350 bars. And we are a long shot away from Raptor development being over. It will be interesting to see which Starship prototype will be the first one to utilize the power of Raptor V3. Who knows, maybe they are even designed with backwards compatibility in mind. Likely not Ship 29, but maybe after that. After being nearly half done, this prototype was mated with the common dome section, which was moved to the high bay on May 11th. Just an hour later, Ship 29's nose cone was destacked using the new load spreader, which had previously damaged tiles on Ship 28. I guess they can't make up their mind. Nonetheless, the construction of prototypes at Starbase is definitely starting to ramp up again. Looking at the aerial photos, we can see that SpaceX is trying to better organize the whole build facility. The ring yard now has been labeled, clearly stating the destination of each part. Almost as if they'd done this for Mauricio. A Falcon 9 landing zone has also appeared just outside Mega Bay's entrance. Is SpaceX planning to turn Falcon 9's into a steel roll delivery service? Well, probably not, but hey, it would be quite the sight. In reality, it's more likely that the beams near the Mega Bay 2 Foundation are just getting ready to be used as parking spots for ring sections before they enter Mega Bay. 
Exciting developments unfold at the Sanchez site, where progress is abundant. Two sections of the new Mega Bay are nearly finished. Another one is already in construction. When ready, they'll be transported and connected piece by piece at the build site. Of course, with beams arriving near Mega Bay 2's foundation, the anticipation builds as first floor construction is poised to commence swiftly. Lastly, let's take a look at a surprising tweet from Catherine Kerner, revealing one of the first looks at Starship's control panel. And now let's move on to something I love, because the way to a man's heart goes through his stomach with Magic Spoon. I only promote sponsors I like, check, so let's test it. I wanted to try a variety of flavors, and variety they provided. Magic Spoon's variety pack came with fruity, peanut butter, cocoa, and my personal favorite, Frosted. Find the taste you love. I know, it's just a cereal, right? Not entirely, hear me out. With 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein and 4 to 5 net grams of carbs in each serving, Magic Spoon is an entirely different story. That makes only 140 calories per serving. They are also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free and soy-free. Magic Spoon is basically cereal reinvented, wholesome and high quality. They have the great taste you love, with more protein and less sugar. It's just not like any other cereal. I might actually not go back to other brands. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code FELIX at checkout to get $5 off any order or go to magicspoon.com slash FELIX. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR on the screen and use the code FELIX for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash FELIX to save $5 today. Catherine is responsible for managing the development of human spaceflight activities related to the Moon and Mars at NASA. On May 9th, she shared a picture of the Starship Human Landing System Simulator. Not much can be seen through the screen's glare, but for us space fans, that's enough to make at least some assumptions. If you think that you've seen this interface before, that's because it is the Dragon's interface. Just reskinned to match the Starship's layout. It's difficult to tell how much of this is based on the real design. Just three Raptor vacuum engines can be a clue that it's an outdated mock-up. The clearly visible on-screen link caught my attention, but it appears to be a page hosted on SpaceX's intranet. Sadly, it isn't publicly accessible. As time goes on, we should start to see both more software and hardware related to Starship HLS. The supposed launch of Artemis 3 is still planned for 2025. What do you think? When will we see the first Starship Luna lander? A few months from now? Maybe a year or perhaps even longer? As always, please let me know in the comments. I'm excited to read what you think. And while you're at it, hit that like button, subscribe or even become an active supporter by clicking the join button or by following the Patreon link in the description. You'll gain behind the scenes access, including our Discord server. But that's not all. Let's take it to the next level. Subscribe to Y on Twitter for even more updates and exclusive content. Join the incredible community of supporters there and be part of our journey on multiple platforms. Your direct support powers Y and I'm immensely grateful. Thank you so much for being a part of this adventure. On we go. Now in the last episode, I talked about pushing the private space exploration envelope by offering commercial visits to the ISS. Turns out it was only the beginning, as one company, Vast, decided to take this step further and create their own private space station. Vast, a dynamic young company rooted in California, is on a mission to create something extraordinary. The world's first ever artificial gravity space station. Vast acquired the space company Launcher in February this year, accelerating their development process and advancing their mission. You may know them from their partially flight-proven space tug Orbiter, or their rocket engine simply named E2. Now Vast has unveiled their new proposal, Haven 1. A single module space station meticulously designed to fit snugly within a Falcon 9 fairing, leaving virtually no room to spare. 
That is an incredibly tight fit, pushing Falcon 9 to its limits. The habitat enables 30-day crew stays for research, including in-space manufacturing, and boasts a captivating cupola-like window. Get ready for some breathtaking views of our home planet. Crucially, it possesses the ability to generate artificial gravity, matching that of the Moon by self-spinning. Should the module prove successful, a larger Starship-class module with a diameter of 7 meters is planned for construction. Such modules will then be used as building blocks for an even larger spinning stick-type space station with the goal of creating a full-blown space odyssey-like station in the future. Right now, Vast is joining the race for the title of the first company to own a commercial space station. There's not much competition in this field yet, but their main competitor will likely be Axiom Space, as their station is now years in the making. Barring any setbacks, Haven 1 is scheduled for launch by the end of 2025, closely followed by the highly anticipated Vast 1 mission, marking the exciting debut of crewed operations. The pursuit of privatization in the space station sector is admirable, highlighting a positive step forward. Yet, it's crucial to recognize and appreciate the existence of other established space stations. Ensuring a complete perspective within the broader landscape of space exploration. One of them is the Chinese space station commonly referred to as Tiangong. It has been in orbit for only two years, yet it has already had six resupply missions. On May 10th, Tianzhou-6 atop a Long March 7 rocket launched from the Wenchang spaceport. What sets this mission apart from its predecessors is the inclusion of an upgraded variant of a cargo capsule bearing the same name. This brings the max payload mass from 6,900 kg all the way up to 7,400, making it the most capable operational cargo capsule, even beating SpaceX's Dragon 2 in payload capacity. Just like typical resupply missions, the upgraded Tianzhou brought essential resources to the space station, including propellant and xenon to allow for maneuvering, as well as food, water and various science experiments that will be conducted both by the Shenzhou 15 and the Shenzhou 16 crews. Currently, the station takeover is planned for the end of May, when a group of three as of now unknown Taikonauts will launch on board a Long March 2F rocket. China's space exploration is quickly gathering momentum. Who knows, maybe in a few years we'll see their attempt at a moonshot. Equally impressive is the progress of the New Glenn rocket, which is also making significant efforts towards its own maiden mission. Last week we focused our attention on some of Blue Origin's testing facilities. It appears that they are getting really close to a second stage pressure testing before wrapping the upper stage in insulation. Thanks to the Family Day event at Cape Canaveral, a few launch complexes were open to tourists. One of our friends, John Winkop, managed to visit Launch Complex 36, from where Blue Origin is planning to launch its massive New Glenn rocket in the future. He captured some interesting shots of the launch pad itself. What you can see here is probably a second stage adapter that allows the use of the launch pad as a static fire stand. It's a brilliant move from Blue Origin. Why transport everything to the Stennis Space Center when you already have all the necessary ground support systems, including even the flame trench? It's still unknown when any new Glenn testing is supposed to happen, but knowing how secretive they can be, I wouldn't be surprised if it were any day now. That's not all. During the event, something even more shocking was spotted. A Starship Serial No. 4 at one of BO's testing facilities. Oh wait, that is not a starship. If you've been following Team Blue for a while, you probably already know what this is. It's the Project Jarvis Test Tank. An experimental program that aims to develop a reusable upper stage for the New Glenn rocket. In 2021, we saw a similar tank, but this one clearly is a different prototype. Not much is known about the program itself besides that it's trying to mimic Starship's hardware-rich philosophy. It may or may not be working as we haven't really seen many Jarvis prototypes. We could argue that Jeff Bezos taking inspiration from SpaceX is a bad thing, but I'd say that in this case it's a good thing. More reusable rockets would mean a significant decline in price per kilogram to orbit, strengthening the emerging low-Earth orbit economy even further. While Blue Origin doesn't like to share its test campaign, another very well-known company does. 
United Launch Alliance just conducted a flight tanking test of their newest yet to be flown Vulcan Centaur rocket. Nearly two months ago on March 29th, an anomaly occurred during testing on one of the Centaur 5 stages at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. It had nothing to do with the vehicle that's on the pad at Slick 41 at Cape Canaveral, but nonetheless, just to be certain, the whole test campaign was placed on hold. That was until May 11th, when the first almost ready to fly Vulcan Centaur was rolled out from the vertical integration facility at ULA's Pad 41 for one of its last tests. The flight tanking test is different from a wet dress rehearsal. It aims to see if both the first and second stages can be safely fueled without actually simulating a countdown like during a wet dress rehearsal. On his Twitter, the man himself, Tori Bruno, informed that the test went according to plan. We're still waiting for its results, but assuming they are also within the rocket's limits, we can expect Vulcan to return to the VIF for additional checkouts. Next, the rocket will be rolled out again, this time to go through a full-blown wet dress rehearsal and hopefully a 6 second static fire. As of now, we don't have the Vulcan launch date, so look out for any updates on our Twitter at Felix Schlapp. Let's end this episode with some juicy news. The European Space Agency's juice is finally unstuck. During its commissioning phase, one of the most important science components on the spacecraft, the 16 meter or 53 feet radar for icy moons exploration antenna, failed to extend. It all came down to one tiny single pin that got stuck during the development. Fortunately, engineers at ESA had plenty of ideas on how to remove it. At first, Juice's thrusters were engaged. This was supposed to shake the spacecraft and break the antenna free. Wiggle wiggle. It didn't help, so the whole satellite was moved so that the blocked pin would face the sun, as maybe thermal expansion was the thing holding the mechanism back. While engineers started to see some movement, that clearly wasn't enough. Finally, a command was sent to power on a non-explosive actuator, which delivered a mechanical shock that finally set the entire thing free. The antenna is finally properly extended. This is a huge deal. Once Juice arrives at Jupiter, it will be able to study its icy moon surfaces up to 9 kilometers or 5.6 miles deep down below the surface. That's it for today. Remember to like and subscribe. Check out our merch store to beef up your space nerd wardrobe. Epic merch and absolutely worth a visit. And if you want to get even smarter about space and rockets, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. In make. In, in making. Almost as it... As it, as it. The antenna is finally pro properly extended. Something caught my eye.